Thanks very much, uh, Malcolm. And wow, it's amazing to see so many people here at the Lecture Theatre. I'm rather out of practice at this, I've got to tell you. Uh, and it's nice to see old friends, but also rather extraordinary to meet so many people I've only ever met on Teams before. I know we're kind of all here at this at the moment, but it really is quite amazing. Uh, Malcolm said quite a lot of things I wanted to start by saying, actually, but I'm going to repeat some of them because uh, it's important. And I do this uh, with medical students sometimes. It's a bit facetious way to start a lecture. But it's quite a nice approach. Why are we here? To ask ourselves, why have we spent our morning uh, when we could be doing all sorts of other important things, probably, coming here to talk about uh, research? And I'm going to start with the point that Malcolm made, which is really important, which is the challenge of improving the health and care research that we do. I'm just going to put that out, of there, out there for a second for you to think about. So whether we are involved in applying for funding, delivering research, recruiting patients to studies, I think it's fair to say that in this region we could all do better. And that is really, really important for the reasons that Malcolm has listed uh, to us. It's important for the people we care for. It's certainly true that people do better if they're part of research active in environments. They benefit from the research, uh, uh, research findings. And as I'll talk about in just a second, they get an opportunity to um, contribute to research development. This is the argument that wins most money at the trust, where I do the other parts of my life, the acute trust. Patients can't, on the whole, choose where they go to be treated, but staff can choose where they go to work. Malcolm's talked about staff uh, at burnout, but actually attracting the brightest and best people to come and work in the places we work and have enriching careers and develop themselves is something that research can really, really uh, make a difference about. I've got a sign that says live captions in front of me, but you can't see that. It's crucially important for the people we educate and train, so the students at the, at the universities, but also the people who come and work in our environments who want to make research part of their, of their careers. Um, this, for me, is a really important point. With the other part of my life, sorry, I should have introduced myself, and I'm an infectious diseases doctor, and most of what I do is run antimicrobial resistance research, which sort of disappeared for two years while I was looking after people with COVID, but it's really coming back as a, as a priority now. And I'm involved in some national stuff about how we redo antimicrobial resistance research following the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And it's really hard to overstate the impact that that experience has had on the NHS and NIHR on its vision for, uh, for research. A term I've not really heard people use before, but I'm going to use it now, so maybe you can see I've coined it if you like, is mass participation. What happened in the UK during COVID-19 was an extraordinary mass participation in research. There were, up until this week, almost a million people admitted to NHS hospitals with COVID-19. Uh, you don't want to guess how many of those people contributed data to research. 10%, 20 percent, 30 percent, 50 percent, 100 percent? So about, well, higher than 100 uh, <laughs> percent. About 350,000 of those patients contributed data to research. 500,000, or more than 500,000 people took part in the ONS survey and 250,000 households took part in the ONS survey. 500,000 people took part in vaccine trials. 50,000 people took part in the recovery trial alone, which was the, which the individual patient randomized controlled trial in hospital practice. This is a degree of research participation that has never been experienced before. And the challenge that NIHR is really placing to us all is the other priorities, obesity, the mental health epidemic which is following uh, COVID-19, my own area, AMR, how do we unleash that same vast potential for, for people who work in health and social care and people who, who, who receive social health and social care to participate in research in a way that they never did uh, before. Um, so the other reason I think all this matters is we want to deliver evidence which is I'm going to try and move this because half my screen has disappeared, which is relevant to the people of Brighton and Sussex. Brighton and Sussex, and that it sounds a little bit like a sop, but it's really important because uh, it, patients and public should input to the research that we do. And if we're not doing good research, the people around here don't get that opportunity. They don't get the opportunity that people who live in Manchester or Oxford get. And so we are failing people if we are not delivering research that they can input to, which is impactful on their on their care. We're also missing the opportunity to create a unique contribution. Why would funders come and fund us to try and do something which Oxford and Manchester and other places can all do perfectly well? They want to see us do something which is unique and unique based upon the needs of our population and the unique strengths of the organisations that we can bring together in a partnership like this, particularly uh, across the two parent universities. 
those of us doing research for living, if you like, live and breathe by impact. So how do we do research which changes the world, visibly changes the world? And we really struggle often to do that because we don't have the roots out beyond our Lancet paper, as Malcolm's mentioned, to things that really matter about changing the care that people receive. And so we want to achieve that. And finally, because it comes up in a lot of the discussions that I'm going to show you, economic benefit. So why do we need a partnership to achieve these things? Well, as Malcolm has said, and one of the sort of starting points to the work that he and Jackie did in developing the HRP, similar partnerships are a pretty widespread feature of places in the country that do this well. And it's becoming quite conspicuous that we don't do it in that way. So here's just two examples. Malcolm refers to the new medical schools, so this medical schools that were founded around the same time as us, partnerships in those regions which have allowed them to develop the sort of unique contributions and, and successes that they have had. At the other end of the spectrum, there are currently eight of these so-called academic health sciences centres uh, designated by NHS England and NIHR for demonstrating excellence in health research, education and patient care. And you can see the words I put in bold. So these are regional partnerships, expertise from the university and NHS organisation, local partners, so coming together to deliver really impactful locally relevant uh, research. We're not even at this first line and we'll hear later on from Professor Trembath about some of the journeys that, that, that you need to go on to get to this last place, uh, to, to, to the status of HSCs. But the journey is long, I have to tell you. And I think that we need to begin it if we're ever going to finish it. But it is a long journey. Why now? So the reason I, you know, when Malcolm said, would I get involved in this, I said yes, is because I genuinely think there is a rather extraordinary moment of opportunity, actually, both in terms of some national things that are going on and locally. So I've talked a little bit about this already, but major changes in the way that the NIHR and the NHS and Department of Health and Social Care thinks research should be done. And if you want to snooze for a couple of minutes through some busy slides, I'm going to tell you the punchline. Where we are going is from a model of medical research which is conducted in medical schools, universities, by people with PhDs involving very small numbers of people to answer very specific questions. And we are moving to a world which the emphasis completely shifts to research being delivered by people whose job it is to deliver care in the place where that care is being delivered with participation of people receiving that care. And the challenge for us is how to make that journey because that's where the money is. That's what people want to see us do. And what I would say is that actually we have a much better opportunity to do that journey flexibly because we haven't got a lot of the very rigid structures which exist in some of the very long-established academic institutions with huge departments of this, that and the other. So these are busy slides, but I've deliberately sort of taken almost the entire um, uh, briefings from the start of these documents and turned them into sort of word clouds to highlight some of the words that keep coming up. So this is the NIHR's relaunch of its strategy following COVID-19. Sets out how the NIHR aims to address health and social care challenges building on the experience of the, of the, of the pandemic. Is this point going to work? So they want to see more integrated research, research that reduces disparities. This was a big, big theme of COVID-19 research. Uh, the, the lack of, of, of representation across the, across the uh, different sectors of our society. Socioeconomic factors, geography, age, ethnicity. Research needs to be practically and meaningfully embedded in, in the experience of patients and service users, where they get the health and social care, the not traditional research active. Um, improving clinical outcomes conducted with patients and citizens in the communities and geographies most affected. So they want to see research is locally done where the people are being cared for. NIHR need to weave research into the daily lives of professionals across the country. They don't want to see us doing this research in universities. They want to see people doing this research where care is delivered, which increasingly is in people's own homes. They also stress the huge economic opportunities which arise for an area both direct and indirect from being research active. Here's the Department of Health and Social Care's version of this, using COVID-19 as a springboard. Research is the single most important way we can improve our health care. And they want to see our research driven by data and analytics. Again, embedding research at the heart of patient care, making participation as easily as, easy as possible, all health and care staff empowered to support research, capitalising on health data, creating new digital infrastructure. So one of the other drivers I'm going to talk about in a second is the increasing digitisation of health data and integration of health services, which really allow us to start doing research in this different way. Again, uh, dealing with health inequalities, stimulating economic growth. And just to focus the minds of the organisations whose primary 
uh, raison d'etre is delivering patient care. The CQC now recognise this, in fact, this was from just before the pandemic, as one of their key lines of inquiry when assessing uh, NHS organisations for their well-led status. They want to know what organisations are doing about ensuring research is taking place as it should be in their organisations. So, uh, why now? So, as, as, I, as I've mentioned, emphasis on integrated care. So this is a story which has been going on quite a long time in the NHS, but for those people who aren't working their daily lives in the NHS, I think it's slightly crept up on people during the pandemic, a lot of other stuff uh, going out. It's been set out in the NHS long-term plan. But it's really come into existence this year with the opening of the integrated care services. And this really takes the NHS to a place which, if you work on it, is, in it, is completely self-evident, where you, you recognise that there's a single pathway right the way through from social care to community care to primary care to secondary care to tertiary care. And if you don't think about the whole thing in that pathway, you can't make it work properly. I mean, two-thirds of my patients on the ward of the hospital are currently medically fit for discharge. A lot of their problems that I deal with relate to stuff that happens before they come in. A lot of the problems like that they're going to be left afterwards are going to be dealt with by someone outside the hospital. So these services have to be integrated right across the piece. And so ICS opened and became active, I believe, in, in just in August, and there's people in the room who know much more about this th 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 than I do, but just to highlight a few of the key things for those that aren't uh, 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 up to speed with this. So 42 of these nationally, we have ours, NHS Sussex, uh, locally, and these organisations really bring the whole thing together, and you'll see some of the words which chime with what I've been saying about research. They've, they're tasked with strategic initiatives to make things work better, digital integration, uh, uh, workforce. They've got a lot of the same priorities that we want to have about our research vision, improving patient outcomes, tackling inequalities, and very importantly for building the partnership, strengthening collaborative relationships. Two other why now bits, the dreaded REF. And I'm not going to say much about the dreaded REF except to say, for those of you who don't do this all the time, this is, you know, academics live and breathe this. It tells you, you know, how you're getting on as organisations over long, quite long periods of time. We just finished the last one recently and, and, and got the outcomes from that. The next one, we don't know when it's going to be yet, I don't think, but probably going to be one. It's probably going to be 27, 28, something like that. So a reasonable sort of time frame. And so now is the moment that the academic partners are taking at least medium-term views, I would hope, about the way in which they think about getting themselves sorted out, getting their clinical research, their care research sorted out to be ready for that next assessment in a few years' time. There are decisions being made which will become baked in, I guess, over the coming years around funding, but are being made now. And so I think it's the right time to be having conversations, hopefully, about money. And then finally, with my other hat on, the formation of University Hospitals Sussex. So uh, again, if you're not familiar with this, uh, uh, UHS, X formed from the two Legacy Western and BSUH Trusts as the acute trust for this part of Sussex in April uh, 2021, and thus formed what is one of the largest acute NHS trusts in England. And th just that difference in scale makes a substantial difference to, to sort of research which at least in that part of the spectrum can be delivered uh, locally. Also, I think because of the recognition of some of the changes that I've been talking about, the, the, the trust uh, has, I think, moved from a place where it regarded research maybe as a cherry on the top of a cake of a good performing trust to beginning to regard research as the concrete and the foundations of a good performing trust. And so has introduced this uh, new true north, as they call it, at the trust for research. And some of the words won't surprise you because I helped, helped write them. So the vision they want to have is for the, for, the, for the acute trust to be a place where all their patients and staff have the opportunity to participate in high quality research, which is relevant, so mean impactful on them and their care for them. And they also want the organization to work with partners across Sussex to ensure equality of access for the benefits of health research for the whole population. So they want to be outward looking. They want to be the, the acute trust which contributes to success across the piece, recognizing that they can't succeed unless we all succeed. And I think if we can make that message get into people's minds, then I think we have an opportunity to make the partnership like this work. So what is the Health Research Partnership? Now excuse the, uh, my rather Blue Peter cartoon, sorry, uh, this is DIY graphics. Uh, oh gosh, it's huge, isn't it? But it's meant to try and encapsulate how the six founding partners of the partnership sit together around a table. And I'm sorry if I've not given you the right colour for your, for your organisation, but at least it tells us uh, the differences between them. And I think one of the things that's important to stress about this partnership is that it needs to be 
outward looking again, it needs to be without walls because those people sit around the table at this stage because of prior strong relationships between them. But there are external to them very important stakeholders of relationships and people who in the future will be part of the partnership potentially and certainly will want to stake in how the partnership develops and will need to be part of that for it to succeed. So important NIHR structural stakeholders, particularly the, uh, the ARC, of course, uh, but others here. Uh, NHS stakeholders, uh, the Ambulance Service, I'm sorry for all the abbreviations, uh, uh, Community Trust, uh, Surrey and Sussex, East Sussex, uh, potential future partners not in at the moment simply because of the way the relationships have, have developed. Important academic partners, particularly to the West, so Western uh, Sussex Legacy Organisation have strong academic relationships with the University of Chichester, for example, and I've also put Health Education England on here, and a number of these, these, these bodies are going through changes, of course, at the moment, but Health Education England already have made important collaborations with us around, for example, career development in the research space. So these are all potential stakeholders in the, in the, uh, in the party, in the partnership. This is reproduced from the original specification document. This is what the partnership was designed to achieve, to develop opportunities for shared research infrastructure, capacity development, and academic collaboration. I've underlined and drawn those out separately because you'll see in a minute those are work streams in the partnership and we're going to talk about some of the detail. But one of the other themes that's come out, or two of the other themes that have come out in the early work of the partnership in the last few months has been that as we start to think about what this is going to look like strategically, what are our principles going to be? <clears throat> I think for it to work, we have to create a partnership which supports each partner realising their own ambitions. All the partners have got ambitions, they've got strategies, they know where they want to go with their research. And what they want to see is what's the partnership going to do for them? How are they going to make that work? And if we don't acknowledge that and, be, uh, you know, and, and articulate that well to our partners, we're not going to get any money out of them. Um, we're also, though, going to need to build this shared, unique profile for this partnership so that in 10 or 20 years' time, however long that journey takes, we are known for doing these things. This is what we do, and this is what people will come to to do this stuff, and they will fund us to do it. And that's going to be a, a journey, and it's going to take a lot of thought and, 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 and discussion with everybody, but we're going to need to be, build a unique profile for our partnership, unique in the country. So, uh, just to briefly talk you through the governance structure, how this is working, and you're going to hear from different people uh, during the morning involved in bits of this. So, the, 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 the partnership is, is run day to day by an executive management uh, group, and this has started meeting monthly. It met for the first time uh, in June, and involves pretty high partner level uh, representation. So, the trust R&D directors, senior university academic representatives, people who can be expected to have a really good understanding of their whole organisation rather than just their, their silo uh, within it. Represent representation from the ICS and then the existing structural uh, uh, elements, things like the Clinical Trials Unit and the JCRO, which Malcolm's already, already mentioned. Uh, representation from the Finance Group I'll talk about in a second and the different work streams below. And the Executive Group is really responsible for the operational oversight and developing and implementing the strategy of the AHRP and monitoring its, 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 its good functioning, really. And the focus of the first few months' work since June has really been around this, this consideration of what is in scope. What is the HRP? What do we consider to be health and care research? Who's in? Who's out? How do we make sure that this partnership forms without, without walls? And we'll talk a bit more about that in the work stream talks later on. So we have these three work streams focusing on infrastructure, uh, the academic groups that do research and capacity building and training. And as I say, these are going to, we're going to have short talks uh, related to each of these in, in, in a few minutes. Again, cross partnership input to each of these. So there's representation right the way through uh, the structure. Um, their role is to identify whether shared resources, common interests, synergies, identify gaps for investment, and, and develop opportun identify opportunities which can, can be developed into uh, proposals. They will report on the performance and impact of HRP to the executive. And I say they've also been meeting since, uh, since June. Money is really important here. One of the conversations I had very early on with, with, with Malcolm and Jackie about this is that everyone likes a chat. That's nice. We can all get together and talk about things. But this is only going to be sustained if those chats turn into things that we identify we need, which we make a case for, and are then supported. And that would involve at some stage, getting money out of some people. 
and they will be the partners who, who contribute to the partnership. And so the finance group is terribly important. And so we have a finance group, which is, it took a while to get together, but met for the first time just a couple of, uh, 21st of September, just a couple of weeks ago. And their functions really are to understand the financial landscape of the partnership, who's contributing what, to get that out there so people can really see and understand it. And then help us as we start to develop business cases, understand who should be making contributions to different things, develop those business cases in a way that they are aligned to the needs of the organisations we're going to go to, so that when we go to the various partner organisations and say, we need to develop this because of that, and you're going to be asked for this, they, they understand that, it makes sense, it aligns their priorities, and we're not just told to get lost and caught in the loop of not achieving anything. So they are going to be terribly, uh, terribly important. Patient and public involvement and engagement is clearly going to be absolutely fundamental to this. And we've just begun our thinking around this. And at the execs, we've talked a little bit about the different forms this should take. And I think that there are two dimensions that I'm encouraging uh, us to think about. Uh, how can we ensure there is really impactful and meaningful patient and public involvement and engagement in the strategy development of the HRP itself and delivery of that strategy. And then there's the other engagement, a bit like we said for the, for the, for the, for the partnership overall. What can the HRP do to support its partners achieving the PPIE engagement that they need? I know certainly, for example, at the Acute Trust, we always need better PPIE inputs to the things we're trying to do, the research trying to develop. And accessing that for us as an acute organisation can be very, very difficult. And so the partnership potentially opens up enormous opportunities for us to develop that much more meaningfully for the work that we do. So we appointed our PPIE officer, Lara, who's here today, uh, a couple of months ago, back in August. And she's just beginning to work on this, really, scoping out the, the possibilities, talking to the, partner, to, to the PPIE leads at the partnership organisations, and will be helping us develop a, a, a PPIE theme within the strategy development over the, over the coming months almost out of time. Above us all sits a very august HRP board which is going to meet for the first time this afternoon and so they are clearly the, the strategic uh, uh, leaders of the, of the, of the partnership uh, ensuring engagement obviously very important to have senior input into that because they're the people who are going to have to help us again when we go back and start making these cases across the partnership uh, for investment. So Pro Vice Chancellor, Chief Medical Officers, the ICS Chair, Directors of the various in, uh, involved NIHR uh, elements. And they're going to meet six monthly and as I say their first meeting is today. So what have we done so far? Well we've started. We've established our key committees, we've finalised our terms of reference, we've started to meet and, 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 and uh, consider the issues. We've made some key appointments, so meet the teams. I've, I've pasted this from the websites. I'm sorry some of the logos cover well, most of my face fortunately. But so, uh, so me, uh, Scott Harfield, who's the research director at, at Legacy BSUH so at University Hospital Sussex, didn't want to surprise the picture. Uh, Nikki Perry, who's the director of the clinical trials unit, who's been instrumental in getting this working and has been very, very important in, in driving the work forward over the last few months because Tanya Telling, who many of you will know from the JCR left, and we are just in the process of appointing a new uh, head of the JCRO and HRP interviews, I think, are next week. Uh, Lara, I've mentioned already, is our PPIE officer, and Dave Todd, our coordinator, who's done a fantastic job organising today. So that's the team at the moment, and as I say, hoping we'll get uh, that box filled, filled very soon. We've got a, a first website where you can go to and start to learn some more about the, the, the function of the HRP. And we've started the work, I've mentioned a couple of times, we're going to tell you about in a few minutes, scoping across the partnership and the different work schemes, uh, streams. Uh, so just to give you an example of how this begins to look, using that terrible diagram again, so we start to put on, a, on, a, on the table, if you like, in front of us, the different bits of infrastructure that may be important. So we start to give even more acronyms, sorry, on the paper version, the, these are all spelt out for you. But it starts to draw to attention really what are the things we, we deliver in terms of infrastructure, who contributes to those things, and don't get het up on whether the colours are right or I've given the right bit of shading to this bit or that bit. But the point is we're beginning to have a conversation about who's contributing what, what it delivers for each other, what we'd like to see, where there are synergies, where there are gaps. And I know Scott's going to talk a bit more about all this later in his, in his, in his bit. Uh, we've taken the first steps with engaging partners about what they want to see from the partnership, how it should work. We're here today. That is probably the most important first step in, 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 in doing that. 
Everybody loves a survey, so we've got a survey, and some of you will have received that. If not, it's on the website. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. We've tried to keep it brief, but I think it's going to be very important for us in beginning to get some information from people about what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, what would they like to see us address. And that's going to be a starting point for a series of much less formal, discursive uh, uh, for next, next year. And the survey is available through the website. And I just put these up here at the end, really very, very speculative, but they just illustrate how once you start to have these conversations, opportunities are there, and we need to think about how we might engage in them. So a number of the NIHR structures are, are undergoing some uh, reconfiguration at the moment. And so the NIHR Research Design Service and the Clinical Trials Unit Support Services are being reconfigured in 2023, and we have been able, within the partnership, to have what feels like a very constructive discussion with the current RDS, which of course is a region-wide thing, so involves Kent and Surrey, about how we support them putting in the best possible bid they can for the future of that, and make sure that we make some inputs to how that will serve the partnership's needs to give us some of the research support that we really want to see. Similarly, the clinical research network that deliver research uh, in, in the NHS, uh, the, the, the hosting arrangements of those are up for, for, for negotiation again next year. And we've had some discussions already within the partnership, and we're going to discuss this properly in the board this afternoon, about whether or not one of the partnership organisations should bid to host the next version of that research delivery service currently held up at, Sus at Surrey. Whether that's in our interest, but that would help us develop what we want to see is open for discussion. But we can go for that as a partnership potentially, and I think the partnership would greatly facilitate that bid if we chose to do that. And then much more speculatively, but just because it came up in discussion yesterday, uh, MRC uh, called just coming out pre-announcement this week for, for uh, major research centre development, and we have the opportunity to at least consider and discuss how we might do that around, for example, uh, mental health services across the partnership involving Sussex Partnership Trust, the University of Sussex and the medical school, for example. So, you know, none of this is necessarily going to happen. I just put them out there as the things that immediately start to appear once you start to have conversations about what we could do better uh, together. So first board meeting today will help us establish the key outcomes and performance measures for the first year. Carrying on talking like this starts to develop a strategy which we hope to have something ready by the summer of next year and really look forward to, to working with you all. Very happy to take some questions now or, or go on as the, as the group. Thank you.